Kyle Sondland and Herbert Konings are founding partners of Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. What's going on, everybody? My name is Kyle Sondland, and welcome back to the Security Token Show, episode 21. And I'm joined with my co-host, Herwig Konings. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving week. We had to take off and see our family, so we've got a heck of a lot of news to bring to you today, and we have an awesome topic, token price transparency. So liquidity is one of the core value propositions of security tokens. And even though we now have financial technology that makes transfer of ownership more efficient, cost-effective, and easier, it doesn't mean that it alone will create liquidity. For that, we need active markets. And for active markets to emerge, we need strong price discovery and transparency for investors. But that's something that we'll get into later in the episode, along with a pretty big announcement. A big one indeed, so stay tuned. But meanwhile, as always, we're going to get started with the latest news And we like to kick it off with our companies of the week, the the companies that we feel are making the biggest moves in the space. It's been two weeks, so an extra special shout out to these companies. Kyle, who did you pick this week? This week for me is HSBC's Digital Vault. And so HSBC Singapore was actually my company of the week in the previous episode. And because they had announced a partnership with the Singapore Exchange and Temasek, for a blockchain trial of a servicing of fixed income securities in the bond market in the $15 trillion Asian bond market, rather. But the company announced that this week that they actually also intend to use blockchain to track over $20 billion worth of private placements that they currently manage at the HSBC global level. And so HSBC will do this by creating a new platform called the Digital Vault, that they're intending to give investors real-time access to records of securities bought and sold on the private markets. And so the HSBC platform will digitize their paper-based records of that private placement process using blockchain to reduce the time that it takes for investors to make checks or queries on current holdings. And so the company is spearheading this effort due to both a company-wide goal to make the bank more efficient and reduce costs with technology, while also responding to the increased demand for high-yield private securities by HSBC clients. So they want to allow for additional means of participating and learning more about the market. And so this is essentially building a giant digital ledger to provide full transparency for all transactional private securities data in the HSBC financial system. And so this is actually a really big deal because private securities in general have always been a tough industry to break into due to the lack of transparency in the space. So providing investors, especially secondary investors, with institutional grade tools that can allow them to better quantify and evaluate this segment is crucial and, and really fantastic. So I'm, I'm actually incredibly psyched to see this launch and, and the effects that this has on investor appetite and really the growth of the private securities industry in general, which trickles down into every industry from there. Really great choice, Kyle, mostly because it's also in line with our topic today about price information. That's specifically why they say they're doing it. And I think it's great to see a company really across the board, whether it's last week or this week, that they have now done two different security token initiatives, one for private placements and another for the Asian bond market. It's just pure validation. And of course, these are major deals that they're working on. So they are going to take a little longer than we expect, but hopefully we'll get a lot of information hopefully in early uh, 2020. It shows that HSBC is really focused on bringing this technology to light and they're trying to tackle it in many different ways. But in each way that they do, it's it's a very strong use case. It's well thought out and and has a high chance of of really being valuable. Well-deserved win. And for me, Kyle, I finally have the pleasure of awarding a company that I've been following a long time in the space. In fact, for those of you listening, you'll even remember me bring them up in the very first episode as well as several others since then. I'm talking then none other about figure slash provenance. So for those of you who don't know, 
This company or companies were built by actually a serial entrepreneur, very well known. His name is Mike Cagney. He previously launched a company called SoFi, Social Finance. It's one of the largest student loan lenders and marketplace lenders in the U.S. And he actually left the company, I believe it was in, in 2017, and most recently launched Figure, which is actually a lender. It is a home equity lender but specifically what they do different is that they lend on chain. So everything that they originate is actually put on the blockchain and the blockchain that they use to originate on is called Provenance and those are as a separate company. However, the real statement goes to the, the success and speed that they've come to market. Within just a little over a year, the company has now raised over $120 million to continue their, their platform development and, of course, more importantly, originate more loans on chain. And now, most recently, news has come out that the company has added yet another, specifically $103 million to their Ooh. war chest. I know. Presumably, to continue to do the same thing, Kyle, loan, originate more loans, and of course, improve their technology stack. And this is actually really exciting because for those of you who understand the marketplace lending and loan space, this means that the company to date has over $200 million. And assuming that they maybe do 50 to 70% of that in originations, maybe more, you know, we're starting to get into the, the volume and the territory of where you can actually aggregate everything and do a securitization. So this is the concept of bundling all of these loans together and selling them off as one big package to somebody. And this is extremely exciting because it's not only a, a recent you know, move by marketplaces to do securitizations in general, but this would be the very first completely on-chain loan book of a securitization. Now, we don't know what it's gonna look like. I have no information on that. One would hope listening to this show, and I certainly do, that that securitization is actually a security token so that anybody could participate in it. But at the end of the day, it could even be just a traditional securitization working with a bank. The difference being that the entire loan book is actually on chain with transparent, fully utilizable data. It's a major difference. There are huge efficiencies. In fact, Mike Cagney recognizes roughly almost 200 basis points of value savings across the chain of, of securitization. And uh, I am a big proponent of it. I've lectured about it at universities. I've created presentations for, for Fortune 500 company on blockchain-powered securitization. It's a fascinating concept. It's, it, to me, actually, what would have prevented the 08 crisis that, that blockchain is often talked about as a solution for. Uh, and and you know, no doubt we will do a, a major episode on this, but I just want to finally be able to say Providence, specifically the blockchain, but figure two, they're, they're my companies of the week. Congratulations. And you know, continuing to look forward to some great announcements in 2020. I think it's a, another great company of the week. I think both of our choices this week were really on point. I echo all of the sentiment that you said, and I actually want to refrain from digging too deep because it is a rabbit hole that we could go in for, for 20 or that 30 is. minutes. And we I have. know that we've got, <laughs> we've got a serious ish, uh, you know, episode here today with, with how many pieces of news and things we want to get into. But regardless, you know, blockchain originated loans and, and this entire process is incredibly fantastic for the transparency of being able to see what you're actually investing in and what assets are actually collateralized by those loans, which is really fantastic. It's awesome to see they've raised a ton of money. I hope that they're able to scale. I hope that means that business is booming for them, which I'm sure that it is. And uh, I'm just looking forward to seeing even more good news coming out of their corner. As am I, as am I. But with that, as you said, let's get right into the news. We've got a lot of information to share, a lot of exciting things that have been happening. And I'll kick it off with some big news from a regular, starting to become a regular on the show, the Deutsche Bors, which is, you know, it's, I believe around billions of billions of dollars in, in assets under management. And Swisscom have recently... Uh, announced that they have settled securities transactions using different blockchain protocols. It's a joint proof of concept involving three different Swiss, Swiss banks. The participants exchanged money in the form of cash tokens against tokenized shares using R3's Corda and Hyperledger Fabric to actually do the cross-chain secure settlement. So we have a lot of different pieces going on here. In fact, there were other participants, including Swiss blockchain firm Dora and Custodigit, which are a joint custodial venture by Swisscom and Signum. 
The firms provided core elements of the digital share registry for the proof of concepts, Deutsche Bors noted. And you love to see, you know, continued pilots and proof of uh, concepts using blockchain technology in this space. This is, again, one of those very institutional transactions. I expect we're going to see a great case study from this. I expect that this is uh, continued proof and support for the, the Deutsche Börse as well as Swisscom and the other entities involved to continue leveraging the technology and see uh, if some major transactions start to occur as a result of this. Uh, moving on, you know, we have a, a, a kind of a recent crash, uh, more of some negative news from the Dusk Network. So we had covered this platform a little while back. They had actually done an ICO in the past, but one of their big drivers for the Dusk Network was the fact that they're focused on security tokens, but trying to leverage a lot of the benefits of privacy from Monero and others. However, because of delays that do not meet the, the timeline that the company had put out. The mainnet launch delays have caused a bit of a crash, in fact, all-time lows for the ICO price. And at the end of the day, uh, the supposed STOs that were supposed to launch, the Maltese BWRE, a, a Maltese real estate fund of about $24 million to be tokenized, is obviously not going to be issued on time. There's no further news around that, so I assume that they're all just delays. We're not talking about any type of official cancellations. So hopefully things get back on track for the Dusk Network in, in Q1 of 2020. We hope to see them launch some, some STOs. They have a strong support socially online, and uh, so hopefully that they've got a lot of, a big team, and, and uh, they've got certainly have a lot of people rooting for them. So I hope for them the best moving forward. Us too, but now we're going to move on to a bit of a regulatory uh, segment that I've been able to aggregate here because there's been a lot of news both in the U.S. and around the world from a legislative perspective, specifically I think leading off here with FinCEN, who the uh, 18th episode of our security token show, we actually covered stable coins and specifically their potential to be securities or otherwise. And one thing is now officially absolutely certain. FinCEN has come out to say that stablecoin issuers are, in fact, money transmitters no matter what. This means that all stablecoins issued in the U.S. will need to register with FinCEN as money transmitters, which means you've got to register in all individual 50 states that you intend to offer the coin <laughs> to. And as the, the director, Kenneth Blanco, said, it does not matter if the stablecoin is backed by a currency, a commodity, or even an algorithm. The rules are all the same, he says. This includes doing KYC and AML compliance, among other regulations the companies will need to follow as a result. And Blanco describes the situation in, in a bit of a, like a car manufacturer's analogy. You can't build a car that only goes 150 miles per hour and ask us to change the speed limit. That's not happening. Build your car to meet the requirements, he says, obviously referring to stablecoin issuers who are trying to navigate the laws or request FinCEN adjust them. Honestly, it doesn't surprise me. It's very similar to what the SEC has continuously voiced that for specifically securities that are leveraging tokenization, they still need to follow securities laws that exist. Now, the question remains whether agencies like the SEC or even the CFTC will also have an official opinion around stable coins because there is a lot of talk from regulators. Herbig, I don't know what your opinion is on this, but, but I really can see it both ways. Part of me feels like the car analogy that he uses isn't really the most appropriate because they're requiring KYC and AML for any sale of of a stable coin and we certainly don't have that for US dollars and you know the argument for fiat currency is that it's it's the currency used by criminals for for most you know activity that's outside of the law why because it's not traceable and not trackable so it seems like they're trying to put different compliance regulations on this as opposed to to the backed currency even if you're backing it to a specific currency um, that being said giving giving the powers of printing seniorage, which would be creating new currency out of thin air, giving the ability to do that to stablecoin issuers. I understand where he's coming from here. I see it almost a little bit as our favorite genie out of the bottle effect, that if they were to allow this to happen, it's a lot more difficult to reel it back if it kind of gets out of control. And these regulators, I think, are definitely a little bit afraid that they're not going to be able to properly govern these assets if they get out of control. And they're not sure what those impacts would be. 
Um, but so, you know, fortunately, compliance is, uh, is something you can programmatically enforce and, and it doesn't add it too much additional friction. But I, I do think that it can it, it can cause some stuttering. You know, for I, sure. I don't know how much compliance on this level is programmatically embedded. This is about registering with the money transmitter systems. This is about who is issuing and doing the the money transmission. So I think the reaction has been very expected. This is a blanket coverage response. If you look like a duck and quack like a duck, we're going to treat you like a duck. Uh, and so I think that's been pretty much the, the response. It doesn't surprise me too much. Uh, and as a result of, you know, kind of this conservative approach, it is going to make it, I think, what you're kind of alluding to, more difficult for a lot of these innovations around stable coins to emerge because they are going to blanket all be covered and need to go through all of the licensing in order to be money transmitters in the United States and issue a private currency or anyone else's in a digital format uh, alike. So that, that, that's just uh, what I think yeah. is expected. And we'll see if the SEC has a very similar response for securities. It'll be interesting to see if there's some kind of remittance process or something, a reissuance process, if if you know a stablecoin that's currently issued and being leveraged doesn't follow these regulations, or if they do and they need to reissue, that could be uh, an interesting I process. I think a great to point, right? The SEC has done a lot in terms of being active in regards to the space, whereas FinCEN has yet to really come out and make a lot of major uh, actions upon any specific firms or anything like that going on. It will be interesting to see if FinCEN starts to to actually do some of that stuff. Recision, not remittance. (laughs) Indeed. Um, And moving on to that same topic, we've covered before the fact that there is a Managed Stable Coins Our Securities Act of 2019, which was brought up by two uh, Congress uh, individuals that specifically are worried regarding Libra and the scope and scale of what they're doing. And as a result, have kind of made and sponsored this bill to basically force Libra to be classified as a security. And as a result of that, really encompassing all stable coins in general. So we have on one hand, FinCEN very clearly saying that if you intend to issue stable coins, we will enforce you under our rule. And then at the same time, we have Congress saying, hey, we think that also these things, these stable coins may also be security tokens. And if this law were to be passed, it wouldn't really matter what anything previously was or is. It is now the new precedent. There is no how we test to say whether it's a security. This would actually probably force the SEC to create an entirely new test that would take precedence and say, if this looks like a stable coin, then it's going to be forced to be a security, not because the SEC has anything to say about it, because that's how Congress passed it down and mandated it to them. So this is actually a pretty big deal. We'll see if this has a lot of movement. We're certainly going to track this and, and try to get any news on it in, in the show as we can, because it, it definitely does have ramifications. And I think a lot of people read this as confusion. You know, is this uh, do, do these uh, uh, politicians have a good understanding of what stable coins are? What's the purpose? The reaction that they are suggesting is it appropriate? Right. It's, it's tough to have an opinion on other than the fact that it, if this does happen, it, it will become a new official ruling, which in one case, though, I will say, Kyle, creates some clarity for the first time ever around stable coins and security tokens, at least more so than anything else has in the past here in the U.S. You're not wrong about that. And finally, also here in the U.S., even a presidential candidate, Kyle, Andrew Yang. Ah. He has announced plans to implement a national token framework. Love this it. is, of course, probably slightly in regards to Libra and everything that they've been doing and the rise of security tokens. But the reality is, is as part of this framework in his blog post, Andrew Yang acknowledges security tokens, recommends that they be defined as part of our legal definition, which we've been saying on the show in the past. So even though we certainly don't endorse any specific politics on this show, I do want to give a thank you to Andrew Yang for making this topic one of, one of importance to him and bringing the subject as a result for their mainstream, for even other candidates, lawmakers, and regulators to, to consider and at least better understand it. So interesting to see security tokens continue to be propped into the spotlight. So he defined security token? That's he right. Used in, that his, specific in his blog language. post, he, they, they cover all things... Uh, related to crypto. So he does talk about virtual assets and a framework for it in general. So definitely worth checking out uh, what his thoughts are in this blog post. 
And just a quick break for everybody, anything that we talk about on the news, if you're listening, you should be able to find the links in the description, wherever you're listening from, so you can go check out and learn in more detail. And I think with that, we can take a quick flight, quick, maybe long, flight over to China, actually, who recently came out with some news saying that they are going to open the doors for security tokens. They are specifically referring to actually allowing a financial sandbox similar to many of the other countries like Canada, UK, and Singapore for issuers and financial institutions to leverage China as a way to issue security tokens. This, of course, gives the government greater control over all the initial STOs that are launched within the country as they sort of establish these rules for the financial instruments and then how they're governed within China. Uh, I think we're going to get a little bit more news in terms of clarity, in terms of what the actual sandbox looks like, or perhaps even an official framework. But so far, it is just an announcement. Without a doubt, though, continuing the trend that China has now gone full bull on blockchain, and security tokens is very much so a component of that. It's, it's fascinating. They've, they've embraced so many different blockchain initiatives and use cases, but in the last week or two, they seem to have been walking back some of the maybe most extreme or maybe most open market of those use cases. So security tokens, definitely, we always preach global interoperability and jurisdictional compliance. And China tends to, to lean more on closed markets and maintaining their, their own markets. And we'll have to see this. The sandbox probably will initially be very localized. And then hopefully we can scale it from there once the technology has been proven. So it's exciting. Definitely. Great point, Kyle. I'd love to see how easy it is for foreign issuers to take advantage of that ecosystem. And furthermore, what kind of marketplaces and exchanges develop for that ecosystem as well. And moving on to another jurisdiction, we actually got some great coverage specifically regarding the rules for issuing an STO in Malta from Gene Dayev. He's the founder of STO Box, which is a European issuance platform. And he sees the jurisdiction as one of the top places in the world to issue an STO. The quick summary of it is that Malta is governed by both EU regulations and also specific Maltese ones. These are, you know, not a surprise to anyone, I think, listening, because Malta has been a very progressive country when it comes to legislation for uh, crypto and virtual assets, specifically regarding three different frameworks that have been published by the Maltese authorities. And there's a fourth one regarding STOs to be expected uh, to be launched very soon. And, and of course, we did also get some guidance that we did some coverage on regarding the STO consultation paper that was released by the Malta Financial Services Authority. Really, the takeaways that you're offering will need to work with the MFSA licensed service providers, presumably talking about broker dealers and issuance platforms, potentially, and that the STO will need to fall within the framework of STOs which have been defined by the MFSA, which are pretty much the same traditional securities characteristics like the intention of profit and voting rights and the like. You'll need to be able to leverage some of the existing exemptions available today in the EU, which are basically doing a private sale to accredited investors or doing one of the crowdfunding exemptions where you can raise up to 5 million euros uh, according to that exemption. For more details specifically, of course, check out the article, which can be found, of course, in the description here or directly on securities.io. Next up, my segment here is talking about five new players that have entered the industry in the last two weeks. We had not heard about anybody before, and now we've got five new pioneers. I'm excited to share them all with you. The first is the platform called iBet by Boostry. And on our last podcast, I had highlighted that there was a recent rise of the Japanese STO ecosystem, which, which really emerged faster than any other ecosystem that we've witnessed to date. And one of those criticisms that I had about the Japanese e ecosystem was that there was actually a lack of exchanges supporting that infrastructure. There was really only a focus on the issuance platform Securitize, which has a great relationship with many of the firms out there. And so uh, as quickly as I brought up that concern, it has now been dispelled with this announcement here, latest from Boo Street, uh, announcing the iBet platform focused on the, the exchange and marketplace technology. It's, a, it's in a joint venture by no, Nomura and Nomura Research Institute, which are both, Kyle, billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar financial services and consulting companies out of Japan. They have tens of thousands of employees. This is actually definitely a major platform coming into the space in, in that ecosystem. And, you know, you can check out the tweet uh, and the information about iBet. You can learn more about the platform. They're currently looking 
for new partners and everybody at launch. It's obviously very early days, so there's not too much information we can derive. And of course, we'll be looking out for, for anything that they release. Exciting stuff. Next up, number two is Choice Trade. It's a broker dealer out of Puerto Rico. They recently announced that they intend to enter the security token space by expansion of their back end to facilitate crypto security token transactions and secondary market trading for private equity securities. Previously, Choice Trade self built proprietary systems and existing retail brokerage operations that includes robo trading. And additionally, its customer base is diverse and spans the United States and over 100 countries worldwide. All of this is an effort to grow an even larger consumer base. The firm will also release a micro investing app. So we're, we're seeing a lot of technical innovation coming out of this broker dealer, but it's certainly worth taking note that they intend to become an active BD in the US security token market. The third player is another broker dealer in the US market that is coming to space. This one unlicensed. Choice Trade does already have their the licensing with FINRA in place. This one, Texture Capital, is being launched by Richard Johnson and made some waves because he is leaving uh, as an investment banker from Greenwich Associates. Johnson doesn't anticipate competing with the like of issuance platforms like Securitize, but instead is also focused on bringing traditional banking services like structuring and syndication to the STO industry and feels like there's an opportunity, specifically because he's been covering the topic in technology at his time while he's been at Greenwich. We'll definitely be looking out for more news from Texture Capital. And next up, we have another defection, specifically this one from UBS, a 12-year veteran there, Cloud Wildschli, who is launching a US-based issuance platform called Tokenese. Cloud launched the platform recognizing tremendous potential in the security token technology, describing the opportunity as the following, saying, today we have two separate camps, tech companies with immense tokenization ca capability, but little financial acumen and financial services company locked into their traditional business models who experiment very little with new technology and nothing substantial to date. And he sees a huge opportunity, obviously, leveraging the ERC-1400 standard for its tokens. And we'll be looking out for more information from tokenese specifically regarding perhaps any any clients or any specific differentiations. And last but not least, the fifth company that I find uh, absolutely incredible is Wethak Capital. They are a new player in the Middle East, specifically focused on launching Sukuk offerings, which are Sharia law compliant investment instruments akin to bonds, which actually there's a trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar market out there mandated by Islamic firms, Kyle. It's a massive space. It's a real need and a focus, and I think that this is something that separates WEFAC Capital. They, in fact, announced a successful pilot using R3's Corda last week and excited to push in the age of STOs for Sukuks. And as CEO Mohammed Ashasi says it, we are pleased to have achieved this milestone under our innovation testing license from the DFSAA, which is the authority there in the Middle East, with the generous support of the DIFC ecosystem. We are one step closer to releasing our infrastructure to the market and facilitating the Islamic capital market to reach its four times growth potential as a result of security tokens. Very, very cool. I want to give a congratulations to iBet, Choice Trade, Texture Capital, Tokenese, and Wethak Capital for being pioneers in this space, launching more infrastructure and innovation uh, for the, the industry worldwide. It's really exciting to see a bunch of new players entering the space from so many diverse financial jurisdictions. I mean, especially, I tend to be most excited about the, the broker-dealers looking to bring in new investors because a lot of the investor interest and in the, the financing of these deals is definitely a big piece that we've seen in the security token space that still is looking to develop fully. And we saw Watchdog Capital a few weeks ago announce that they're going live, that they're fully focused on this space. We've got two more today. But then on top of that, we've got, I mean, this this final one with Wethak is super fascinating in how they're looking to, to really unlock a type of asset and, and capital structure that, that I, I, as a U.S. localized investor, had no familiarity with and, and something that I would never have been exposed to. And, and to be able to see them, them being able to leverage this technology as well is, is really, really exciting as we see so many fascinating use cases for this technology and for these financial instruments that are just popping up left and right. And, and it really shows a lot of promise for 2020. It, it really is an, an overstatement when they say trillions of dollars of capital are, are ready to be unlocked. 
And with that, I, I'm going to end the segment of news here on some infrastructure updates. Securitize has, has been on a roll, continuing to be the most actively funded issuance platform in the world, with over 30 million raised and 14 million of it fresh from Santander and MUFG, the fifth largest bank in the world. Carlos Domingo, who's Securitize's CEO, recently told Coindesk that they received yet another seven-figure investment, this time from Japanese conglomerate SBI. The exact amount is undisclosed, but it once again strengthens both the company's war chest and position in Japan. In fact, you'll see on the Securitize website, the only other language option is Japanese. Some quick insight for our listeners too. Carlos Domingo previously lived and worked in Japan and is fully fluent. No doubt his previous network and personal association with Japan is driving a lot of this business. And as we said earlier, it's one of the fastest growing ecosystems there have been tokenizations that have come out of Japan already in the past few months. We're seeing a lot of infrastructure. There's even a, a research council. Very, very cool stuff. And just more great news for Securitize there. Congratulations to Carlos and the team. Next up, we, we also have some more information that, that previously was undisclosed regarding Open Finance, the first you know, security token exchange to come to market. They have uh, filed recently with the SEC that they closed on $8.6 million from 19 different investors and that they also have intentions to source an additional $50 million in the near future. This is the first official information regarding the company's previous financing. And all that being said, the company has managed to accomplish quite a lot, in my opinion, compared to its competitors who on average, you know, as exchanges and marketplaces tend to raise anywhere between 12, 25 to $100 million like T0. Uh, and, and some others even before having launched yet, you know, regarding Kyle's list of 50 plus uh, exchanges and marketplaces that you guys can go check out as well. Yeah, OFN, Open Finance doesn't quite have the same name recognition as T0, but the team has really accomplished some, some great things over the last couple of years. And uh, I feel like one of the main problems facing secondary trading of security tokens is the lack of, of public market transparency. And so we're, we're looking to improve that from both sides, um, which is causing the waning relevance and in investor interest, which seems to be hurting the exchanges the most. So the fact that they've been able to do so much with, with a relatively small amount of funding is really a fantastic achievement for the team. And, and I hope that they continue to, to get close to that $50 million goal and can continue scaling that to onboard additional assets moving forward. Completely agree, Kyle. Next up, we have Franklin Templeton, which back in the middle of September, I mentioned the $700 billion asset manager because they announced plans to launch a fund vehicle using blockchain and security tokens using the Stellar blockchain. As a result, they even won the company of the week, of course, because of their massive influence and impact both in the traditional financial world and now in the security token space. This was you know, it's huge news, but now we, we've gotten even more information. News has come out that the firm is tapping into a wallet technology provider, Curve, for the tokenized shares. Curve would be responsible for helping Franklin Templeton build the transaction signing and management system for its fund. Curve has developed a, a series of multi-party computation protocols, and they seek to remove the need for private keys, which it calls as a single point of failure on the blockchain platform, according to the press release. You know, obviously, as a result, Curve was selected for their focus on the customer experience, security standards, and also their support for the Stellar blockchain. And I happen to agree that wallet technology and private keys are, in fact, both a security problem as well as a user experience problem. So now I'm even more excited to see the, the uh, platform that Franklin Templeton brings to market. They originally described it as a, an app or, or a way to actually participate in buying into the tokenized fund and future issuances by the, the asset manager. Next up, we also have an announcement from Smartlands, who announced their, their new platform, Smarty, which is a friendly and secure app for all your money. Smartlands is a UK, European issuance platform. And Smart T users will be able to receive, store, and transfer all of their euro, pound, and dollars, as well as the most popular digital currencies in their secure mobile app, which is you know also features a built-in wallet. The Smart T app can be downloaded on the Google Play Store. You'll need to register under KYC. Uh, and, and of course, register your payment cards, but you'll be an ideal, ideal tool for your storing, exchanging, and spending needs in both digital and fiat currencies, according to the press release. Smarty's unique features is the customer's ability to receive cash back from their account operations and set up automated investing 
using their in-app robo-advisor. Note that this is exclusive to accredited investors, but CEO Ilya says that the following about the app. Smarty customers will be able to configure the type and scope of their investment portfolio based on the offers available on Smartlands and automatically transfer, for example, 1% of their daily expenses to a digital piggy bank. It's a true definition of passive income with no hassle when your, journey, when your money just hums in the background 24 hours a day, working quietly with no direct participation from you. And, you know, very similar to Franklin Templeton's app, you know, this is a new way for, that's feature rich for users to participate and access Smartlands deals. In fact, it is one of the first ways that I've heard that you can passively invest in uh, all types of private equity. Smartlands does real estate funds and, and many other type of opportunities. So I think it's very cool. You'll be able to kind of passively participate without necessarily having to evaluate and pick specific winners that you're, you're interested in. Uh, I'll look out for, for checking out the, the platform and the app myself someday. Next up, we have the security token platform TokenSoft adding support for Commerce Block. Commerce Block is a blockchain platform that uses Bitcoin to create layered apps using the Bitcoin blockchain. And their announcement with TokenSoft is regarding supporting TokenSoft's compliance and issuance platform on the Commerce Block block platform, enabling customers to use the technology to issue tokens, presumably that are both utility and securities based. There are very few options to issue Bitcoin based security tokens. In fact, this may be the only viable way that I know of, at least today. We'll see if either companies announce any STO clients in the near future, but it is yet another new technology option for, you know, using specifically the Bitcoin based uh, DLT tools to leverage issuing a security token. And last but not least, of course, is uh, an announcement from Polymath announcing that their Polymish platform uh, will be partnering with Parity Substrate. You know, they've been working on Polymesh for nine months. This is, uh, this is Polymath's purpose-built blockchain for security tokens. And the development team has been piloting with Parity Substrate as its blockchain tech solution for the Polymesh. You know, the development team acknowledged that they needed a, a similar modular framework that they experienced building the ST20 protocol using ERC-1400. Uh, but what really what all this means is Polymesh now has officially moved towards an open source model so we can follow along and see community participation, you know, that, that is already familiar potentially with the Parity Substrate platform. And I think it's a great move. Many protocols have done in an effort to create transparency and develop a, a community and apps and, and modules, if you will, around it. And we also have an idea now for what technology will support their next platform, uh, something that you know security token issuers and developers may be sensitive to. We know that the, the Cardano founder is also involved with a lot of this architecture and design. So it's nice to see you know, further uh, confirmation that Polymesh is coming to life. Well, that's a lot of news. We, we certainly covered a lot there. Well done, Herwig. As always, it's important to remind everyone that all of our security token news is found on stomarket.com slash news. We have a full aggregator there where all of these articles are submitted. They're voted on by the community, commented on. It's a, it's a, it's a great platform to be able to stay up to date with the most recent news. But if you're listening and you're you're in the space actively, either as an enthusiast or as someone working in the industry or an investor, feel free to submit your own news that you think is things that we should be covering on the podcast. You can also send that directly to me or Herwig. I'm pretty active on Twitter. Herwig is, is very active on LinkedIn and 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 so feel free to send us anything that that you think is relevant or interesting, and, and we'll definitely review it and, and uh, see if we can fit it into the podcast. So stomarket.com slash news, and we'll actually get into that a little bit more later. But to transition into the new security token offerings, it's a lighter episode this time with our new security token offerings. We just have a couple of, of exciting announcements without a whole lot of actual structure behind it at this point, but I'll keep you updated moving forward. The first one being Sarsen Fund, and Sarsen Fund is partnering with Vertalo for their fundraise. And according to the press release, Vertalo is providing Sarsen Fund with cap table management, asset tokenization, and the affiliation with custodians, exchanges, and issuance platforms. And so this looks like a, a very standard issuance process where Sarsen Fund, I guess, is looking to tokenize their cap table. And obviously a cap table is, is the, the breakdown of the owners of the specific 
asset. So in this case, if it's a fund, it might be the LP and GP interest in, in that fund, or maybe the LP interest specifically in terms of, of those investors and what they are getting in terms of returns from that fund. So they're looking to have a cap table management such system that allows them to manage all of those different investors. If you're interested in learning more, as we had mentioned in the podcast before, Vertalo did a live webinar of them tokenizing an asset and what that cap table management process looks like. So definitely check back into all of their links for any more information on that or go into one of our previous podcasts where we will have those links in the description of each video as well as it's on stlmarket.com slash news. So great for Sarsen Fund. Congrats to Vertalo. Good to see them with another client. And additionally, we have World Chess. And so World Chess is a company that previously held the rights to the broadcast of the World Chess Championships. And so this is actually really exactly what you think it is. It's the Super Bowl of chess. Magnus Carlsen, who's the the best chess player, you know, they they do all kinds of, of chess and it's televised. And so World Chess was the company that that actually owned the rights to that. And they're now doing a hybrid IPO, in which case they're selling a security token in the EU and the US. It's to both investors. And that security token will be eventually convertible into their future IPO shares. So it does seem like it is an equity security token. In terms of any more of the terms, I don't have that information for you now, but it is a hybrid convertible token into their IPO that they're looking to go live in London on their alternative investments marketplace in the future. A little bit of background on World Chess that I was able to find is that they actually had the rights to the World Chess Championship, but lost them in 2019 to a a large company called Gfinity. This is presumably due to a bidding war. Uh, maybe they, they weren't unable to ma- you know, raise the funding that's required, but they're looking to raise capital via a security token, presumably to, to maintain their brand and continue to, to scale all of their different products. And I also was able to find that they're working with the Algorand blockchain and Securitize for this deal. So we've got a Vertalo issuance and now we have a new Securitize issuance. Both of these players are making great moves and have a very healthy pipeline of clients. So congratulations to both teams as well as the issuers themselves. And we wish you the best of luck. Very cool, Kyle. Now, moving on to the market update, we're talking about all of the live tokens that we've got in the industry And uh, as always, as we say over and over, all news and pricing data is sourced from stomarket.com. So if you want any of the info, if you want to see anything up to date, definitely go check out stomarket.com for news and for all of the pricing data. And so first off, as we like to break out, the one token, again, this week seems to be the one that, that really is a significant mover is T0. This is, this, this is a token of, of the exchange equity T0. And unfortunately, the price is still falling week over week. It's, it's sitting at around 87 cents today at close, falling from about 95 cents last week. So they're down again more. The one notable piece here is that they actually had $260,000 in volume daily on November 20th following their investor event, wow. which left the token up 5% on the day. So it wasn't just a massive sell-off. It seemed like there was a lot of interest from, from both sides, and the token actually was up on the day of a $260,000 volume day, which is pretty significant. Pretty great day, yeah. Uh, since then, they've also been seeing double their average trading volume, looking at over $10,000 US dollars per day, as opposed to the five to seven range that we traditionally see them at over the last month or two. So it does seem like there's additional investor interest that being said, it's down probably 10 cents since that investor event. So while the volumes are up, it, it, the, the price, unfortunately, is still not able to find a barrier or a resistance. So they're still searching for, for the, the fair price, I think, of that token. Additionally, we have Lottery.com. This was the other token that, that had any meaningful volume in, in the industry over the last couple of weeks. And Lottery.com woke up from its sleepy 2019 with its highest daily trading volume day ever, 
with over 4,800 shares traded. Unfortunately, it realized it was really a nightmare as over 4,000 of those shares, almost 4,500 of those shares were sold at 20 cents per share, which was over a 60% haircut to what its opening and closing prices were. The token's final trades did close back around that 65 cents open, but the proof's in the pudding that there was a massive sell-off at, at a significant discount uh, for Lottery.com, unfortunately. That leaves our total security token market cap sitting at around 60, 62 million US dollars, which again, as the market continues to, to stagnate, we see that the price is, is declining slightly. But with all of the great news coming out from a lot of institutional players, I'm still incredibly confident that the industry's there, the technology's there. We're just still looking for those high quality assets to actually hit exchanges. I think right now we're still dealing with a lot of lockup periods and a lot of closed market systems. Once those things open, I, I think that we're in for better days. I think I want to focus, you know, my takeaway on your market update here, Kyle, is that we have increased volume. That is what matters. We are getting more and more participation in the tokens. As you say, they are waking up. I'm excited to see at least more and more volume happen. Of course, I wish the best of luck with these tokens. It's very interesting price information that you shared here. With that, I think we can jump into the events section. Not too much happening here the remainder of the year. We do have uh, an overview from that investor event that you mentioned for Overstock. Uh, uh, so on November 20th, you can definitely go check out a video recap of that, again, in the description of the podcast. And there's also the Security Tokens Realized event, which is taking place December 5th in New York. That's roughly two days after you know you're listening to the, the launch of this episode. Thursday, right? Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully you can uh, hopefully you can catch that and register and check that out in time. And with that, I, I want to jump into our main topic of, of token price information. It's certainly come up quite a bit over the episode, and and I think it, it really comes down to a nutshell, right? Security tokens are have long been heralded as these liquid vehicles. When in reality, Kyle, who can say for sure that they are? I think there's been a lot of criticism from those on the inside of the industry that, that certainly liquidity isn't there. And, and more importantly, especially for everyone listening on this show, that liquidity isn't necessarily a function of technology. Just because you tokenize it doesn't mean it's liquid. It actually is a function of an efficient market. There are people that are there that want to buy and sell that product. But we don't really want to dive into, you know, specifically the security token infrastructure that we covered in a couple episodes ago, I believe two episodes ago. So if you want to learn more about the, the key components of what makes up a good security token infrastructure and an ecosystem, go check out that episode today. We're talking more in re re regards to an efficient market and more specifically what makes up an efficient market is price discovery and price transparency. And I think really, you know, it even comes back down to the history. The first public exchanges in the world first proved this by aggregating pools of investors and products and acting as the middlemen to make an efficient exchange system to purchase those financial products on the market. You fast forward today where we have a private market now that is three times bigger than its public counterpart. And most recently over the last few years, we've seen this rise of entirely new asset classes like cryptocurrencies and ICOs. These over-the-counter markets and decentralized exchanges have created new forms of liquidity and certainly to some extent have also been criticized partly as, as broken. And in every single case, though, we can at least say today that there's efficient means to learn about these new products, their prices, and their trading histories. In the end, if security tokens, uh, even though they're heralded as the future of liquidity, I think currently today they are not because of a lack of this issue. In fact, it's a bit of a mission for us, I, I think, Kyle. I'm not going to steal any more of your thunder because <laughs> this is something that you've really been tasked with as a responsibility for security token market to really bring price discovery and transparency to the security token industry. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this whole subject. And I know you've got a pretty, pretty big announcement for our listeners. Yeah, it's exciting. As, as you may know, Herwig and I are, are the founding partners of the Security Token Group, and we have a few businesses underneath. I primarily am responsible for the security token market side of the business in terms of driving the, the marketing ecosystem around security tokens, and, and Herwig is, is responsible and, and really does a great job running a lot of the consulting with institutional clients and working with a lot of, of businesses in terms of leveraging this technology from, from a financial and regulatory standpoint and providing consulting services for them. And so for us, it's security token market, and for me specifically, what I've been, been really focusing on with, with the team is 
getting live security tokens, secondary trading data for the platform. And so this is something that, that we've been talking about a lot over the podcast. It's something that I, I've made a point of discussing at length in terms of how these cert tokens are performing on secondary markets, which ones are successful, which ones aren't quite as successful, maybe due to either price or, or liquidity in terms of trading volume. And it's consistently something that has driven investor interest and, and listener interest as the eventual liquidity is a key component of investing to begin with, right? I mean, the, a, a huge point of security tokens has been this liquidity standpoint of, oh, it can trade on secondary markets. Oh, you can, you can get this thing out and sell this if you want, or you can buy it later. This liquidity piece is something everyone's been talking about. So it is important to consider, okay, you know, when these tokens do go live, how are they performing? Are they, are they successful? Is there interest once they go live on, on markets? Or is it something that, that people don't really seem to be interested in? And so allowing investors and users to monitor the market as a whole is something that, that will allow for price discovery to be much more achievable in terms of what that fair price for an asset should be. And I think that investors are going to be more likely to participate in the industry when they can feel confident about their entry price, about the price that they want to buy at, when they can watch for a couple of weeks or a month and see, okay, this seems like a price range that it's holding steady at, or it seems like I can maybe pick it up at a discount right now because of some news that's going around right now and, and a lot of these, these pieces. But if you don't know the prices, if you can't see the history, how can you be confident in the asset and the price that you're buying at? And so as I mentioned before, this data has actually always been very difficult traditionally to get your hands on. You know, you've got companies like PitchBook that charges tens of thousands of dollars per individual user license just to gain access to private company financials. And so security tokens really revolutionize that by providing a lot of this financial information and a lot of this opportunity for investors. But we've yet to see many solutions in terms of really democratizing that information for all users for free. And so today, we're actually very excited to announce that Security Token Market has done exactly that by aggregating data from two of the leading marketplaces, T0 and Open Finance, and are working with a few more to onboard in the next months to get their, their secondary pricing data onto the platform in terms of historical pricing, in terms of volume, open, closes, highs, lows, graphs, everything you're looking for compiled from T0 and Open Finance, as well as it will scale with future exchanges and you can actually learn about previous trading history, the volumes, current prices, the change over time. All of these things are available on Security Token Market, stomarket.com right now. The homepage is different. If, you're, if you've seen the site, you may notice we've, uh, we've made some upgrades there as well. And so it's a, we really think that this is a huge step for bringing security tokens into the mainstream and making them very relevant for investors. Because before today, investors couldn't really research these prices, learn about the industry, and stay up to date on how these things are performing, let alone have they felt comfortable managing and trading them with no data information available. So hopefully this is going to encourage those investors to feel more excited and more impassioned and more confident in participating in the market and that will lead to a meaningful increase in volumes as a result and hopefully prices as well and so we, we truly believe this is pivotal to the security token industry success not only for engaging with those investors but it also hopefully will allow for the exchanges themselves to begin to make more money, right? As I'm sure you listeners, you may or may not know, the, the way that these exchanges, a huge revenue driver for them, aside from raising funds, is to make money on a transaction basis on the exchange of, of an asset. If you buy or sell a security token, they take a little fee of that each time. And so the more volume uh, in the exchange, the more profits the exchange can make, which allows them to upgrade infrastructure, which allows them to onboard new assets and to work with a lot of the subsidiary or, or, or uh, complementary rather institutions like market makers and others that, that help the investors have a better experience. So the more that we can drive investors to participate, the more that allows the exchanges to be able to scale, maybe even raise additional capital by proving the model, which then results in a better user experience for investors. And again, the highest quality assets at the best possible prices. That's the goal for everybody in the space, a global financial market, and we're trying to do our piece. Uh, of course, Kyle, I know we're also working on an API. We're anticipating integrating more tokens and exchanges, as you mentioned. So this is a, a major step for the future of digital securities. 
We now have a live digital feed and data coming and it's available. Go check out stomarket.com. I already check it out every day and now I'm sure you will too. Go learn about these tokens. It's incredible information. It's fascinating. Uh, it just puts a smile on my face, Kyle, to see you succeed in your mission and get this live before the end of the year. And we'll, we'll look out for your feedback, listeners, to, to anything you have to say that we're missing, that you want us to add. Let us know uh, and, and spread the word, please. And on that note, I think that's about it for the episode. It's been, a, it's been a bulky one, so certainly feel free to reach out to us if you want any more additional clarification on any of these companies. Or, or if you're one of these companies, feel free to reach out and, and let us know any additional pieces you'd like us to mention on the podcast and, and certainly share with, with any of your communities because we do what we can to, to build awareness for the space. So as always, stomarket.com. You can see the secondary prices. You go to the slash news section and see the news. You can check it all there. Herwig, it's been a pleasure. Slash trading for the data. Thanks for listening, everybody. That's the Security Token Show. Mm-hmm.